Bosch, and we have a talk from Bosch. I've known him for a while now, I guess. And the good thing about knowing Bosch is that you can go visit him in many places. <laughs> so the clever way to is that you know whenever you need to go skiing, you can visit in Chile. When you need to go to the ocean, you can go to visit in Berkeley. When you need to go to something more exotic, you can visit in Korea. And of course, his real home is in Slovenia, which is awesome, great place to visit. And not to mention, on top of that, there's many other things that come and go that I have to like. So, um, it's, it's a great kind of collaborator to have if you want to see the world with a single collaborator. Otherwise, we need, you know, 10 collaborators in 10 places to have many of these kind of levels of video. There is the door to Anyway, so we're lucky to have Boa here for uh, today. Um, and if anybody wants to uh, talk to him, there's the window between now and the end of the um, speaker data. And we want to hear more about this Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, galaxy clustering. Uh, just in general, basically how we approach this and how we can develop some theoretical understanding of, of the galaxy cluster. So, um, here's a quick overview. I'll talk about, uh, the first thing I'll talk about is the connection between uh, galaxies and dark matter. All right, and try to uh, develop some theoretical understanding of that. Uh, then I'll talk about the sources of noise in uh, galaxy clustering and uh, how we perhaps can do something about them. Uh, I'll talk about also, you know, basically several steps towards uh, what uh, ideally would be the optimal analysis of large scale structure, and therefore analysis that would ideally be with the smallest error bars on the large parameters. And uh, as part of that, I'll talk about uh, non sanity uh, as a way to uh, probably non sanity with the galaxy surveys. And here's a on this my collaborators. Um, let me uh, start with uh, the required picture, which is, uh, you know, what is a, a redshift survey? It's, uh, it looks something like this. You go out, you measure the redshift to the galaxy, and you make a three-dimensional uh, position uh, of the so-called large scale structure. So uh, here, what is shown is slow digital sky, sky survey. Slow digital sky survey, um, has two components uh, of the redshift survey. One is the so-called main sample, which only extends up the redshift point one or two at most. It's at this uh, wide galaxies here, uh, with about a million of them that have been measured with redshifts. And then there's a much uh, deeper survey of so-called luminous red galaxies, uh, which go all the way up to redshift point four or five. It's a much larger volume, but lower number density. In fact, there are only uh, I don't know, say 100,000 of these uh, measures. But nevertheless, uh, as you probably have heard, that most of the information actually is coming from these luminous red galaxies. So, uh, so what, did one, what does one do with this? The first thing one does is one measures the power spectrum uh, of uh, these galaxies, the uh, point correlation function. And for the main sample, one finds a power spectrum which looks like this. And for these luminous red galaxies, one finds a power spectrum which looks like this. And obviously, they're not the same. So, uh, and that's uh, um, for example, the, the first and the main point actually, the galaxies are a bias tracer of the underlying dark matter, um, so we think. So basically we think that the galaxies trace dark matter on large scales, um, but up to normal constant, uh, which we call uh, linear bias. But then, uh, as we go to uh, smaller scales, higher k, uh, the second problem comes in is that this bias uh, is not uh, uh, a constant, it appears to be a function of scale, and as a result, for example, what I'm showing here is the red uh, line uh, is the linear dark matter power spectrum scaled um, with the bias, uh, and the uh, dashed line is the best uh, model for the nonlinear version. And you can see basically the, this main sample appears to be close to linear, but then this LRG sample appears to be much more nonlinear. In other words, this bias also scale dependent. And so we also need to understand this if we want to have a full uh, model for the galaxy power spectrum. Okay, so it appears uh, to be complicated, and indeed if we look at the simulations, um, uh, 
Um, so from now on, um, when I talk about simulations, I will be uh, talking about um, uh, halos. Uh, the reasoning being that we think that all the galaxies uh, are formed inside dark matter halos. Because only inside dark matter halos can we get enough uh, cooling in order to make uh, stars. Okay, so um, these are halos of different halo mass. Uh, this is their two-point correlation function. Uh, this is for one cosmological model, this is for another cosmological model. Uh, but basically, if we divide this by the, by the linear uh, power spectrum, shown here, appropriately scaled again by, to take out that uh, large scale bias uh, here, then you still see there's a significant scale dependence. Now, this one, this one is no longer in power spectrum. Here I'm showing this function of separation, uh, R. So you can see basically it's scale dependent pretty much on all scales. Now on large scales, uh, it's the scale dependence is about 10% or so, and then on small scales it can uh, it's quickly uh, rising in words. In other words, the power spectrum of the galaxies or the halos is quickly rising above the power spectrum of the dark matter. The linear dark matter. So uh, again, there's a strong scale dependence of the clustering, and uh, that's something that uh, as you can see. Uh, these are pretty large effects, 10% effects these days are big effects. You know, when we talk about precision cosmology, you really want to understand these things 1% precision. So 10% effects are big. The same thing happens when we look at the cross correlation between uh, halos and dark matter. Uh, again, uh, these are the same uh, kind of massive halos. Um, uh, by the way, I didn't actually specify what kind of masses they are. They, these masses go uh, from somewhere between 10 to 12 to 10 to 14 solar masses. And the halo bias uh, is somewhere between 1 and 2. Slightly 1 and 2. Uh, but uh, when you take the ratio, you take out the linear bias, you still see there's a strong state dependence in the uh, cross correlation between gas and dark matter. All right? So uh, it appears, therefore, that this is a, um, that understanding balance clustering is complicated because we need to understand it. Function. Now, fortunately, uh, there is one thing that we can um, do, which appears to be more robust, which is looking at the cross correlation between halos uh, um, and dark matter. We can define a cross correlation coefficient, which is defined here as the cross correlation function between halos and dark matter, divided by the all correlation, square root of all correlation of the halos and all correlation of dark matter. And what you see is this, in this case, for no matter what kind of cosmology, cosmology you take, you see this, this all look pretty similar. First of all, it's, it's something which is very close to the unity, this cross range condition. And second, uh, you know, these deviations away from unity appear to be the same, uh, outside twice the video radius. And then once you are inside twice the video radius, then of course this, this uh, cross range condition uh, starts to increase. And the reason for that is that uh, the defining thing about the halos is they have exclusion. In other words, halos cannot overlap with each other. Um, and that uh, cuts off the correlation, the halo correlation function roughly at twice the real radius. Whereas uh, when you look at all cross correlation with the dark matter, uh, inside the halo, what they're seeing is basically the dark matter profile. So here is something that has W picks up uh, inside. Right? And so as a result, you know, in terms of this point, is, this point the inside twice the radius rapidly picks up because uh, you know, one of these numbers is actually is going to zero. Okay, so um, the good thing is that we can actually model this uh, using perturbation theory. Um, perturbation theory, um, in the case of uh, uh, halos, uh, basically our model standard model for how we can think about halos is that they are a nonlinear response of the underlying density field. Uh, and the way to think about it is that uh, the, you know, the, the halo or galaxy density field is first the matter density field proportional to the matter density field, so in other words, proportional to the density perturbation of the matter times the first derivative. This first derivative becomes the P1, the this linear part of the definition. And then we would have a second uh, you know, Taylor expansion coefficient, which will be proportional to density squared. And that would be the P2 term, uh, second bias, and so on. Okay? 
So if you just uh, cut here, second order, then what we can do is we can calculate the power spectrum of the, uh, this galaxy is crossed with the matter. And we'll, what we'll find is that this B1 times delta cross with delta will give us just the, the uh, dark matter power spectrum times B1. And then the second term is B2 times delta squared. Uh, we are cross that with delta, delta squared with delta, that is zero in the Gaussian case, so we have to go to next uh, order, we have the perturbation theory. That's where we picked up this uh, F2 kernel in the perturbation theory, in which we say delta is proportional to delta squared in the perturbation theory. Delta is delta squared, so that's where F2 kernel picks up and we get the threshold shift like this. And then, so that's on the cross correlation. For the other correlation, we also need to have another term which is uh, delta square square. Right? And that is this B term here, which is actually just uh, a convolution of the power spectrum in itself. This is actually uh, just a correlation function square in real space and real space in OK, so when we define this cross square equation and if we treat these, these numbers as small, then we can simplify everything. And uh, you can probably tell from this expression that this term will cancel. Uh, and we will be left only with this term. And the final result is particularly simple in the uh, correlation function, because this b is, as I said, just the square of the correlation function. If I have a correlation function, we just get this. We have a very simple expression for this cross correlation coefficient, uh, where this alpha is something that has to be despised by the people of the world. So before I tell you how well this works in simulations, I want to actually tell you uh, why this is uh, useful. It's because. Um, well, okay, here is actually comparison between simulations and, uh, and uh, theory. And you know, from this point, uh, from this point, it looks reasonably okay, but not great. But it actually, the cross correlation coefficient work looks much better than this. All right. So why is this cross correlation cross correlation coefficient uh, important? Um, it's because we can actually if um, connect it directly to the observations. The way this goes is uh, through the process of galaxy galaxy lensing. Galaxy galaxy lensing is the, the idea is that well, we have the galaxies, they will, uh, dark matter uh, inside this galaxy, around these galaxies, will tangentially store the back of galaxies. Right? So, for example, you have, you have a shear field caused by dark matter inside these uh, objects, and it's tangential, and it will lead to tangential distortion from the back of galaxies. Um, so one can express this in terms of the transfer separation from the, uh, away from the lens. And if we know the redshift of this lens, this galaxy, which I call lens, then we know actually the transfer separation of physical units are the shear. Uh, this, the shear is basically the tangential distortion of this galaxy, the tangential distance of this galaxy. This can be related now to some, again, some physical uh, units, which is this differential surface mass density, delta sigma which is just average uh, surface mass density inside the radius minus the surface mass, mass density at that radius, right? And so, and then finally, we can express this sigma grid uh, here in terms of just the various distances. All right, the bottom line here is we can measure this in physical units. Um, and what we're measuring really is the two-point correlation function between the galaxies and the dark matter project along the line of sun. That's what we're measuring. But it's in this different differential form, which is the average minus the minus this projected mass density itself. Okay. Um, now there's one problem uh, before we apply this to, to this cross correlation provision that I mentioned before, which is that uh, this differential surface mass density uh, takes all the scales from zero to certain scale r. And remember what I said, this cross correlation coefficient actually, so we have a good understanding for, for the, down to a certain scale, twice the real radius, and then suddenly it just blows up. All right, so we actually want to eliminate very small scale information. And this delta sigma does it because it actually you know, it takes you know, average, average surface mass density within that radius. All right, so that includes information from very small separations, uh, which we cannot model very well. So instead we introduced a, a different statistic term, which we call epsilon. And we just subtract another term, which is a measurable term, delta sigma, and we multiply the term with something r0 square over r square. The bottom line is that then this term depends only on the projection average from r0 to certain r. In other words, all information between 0 and r0 has been uh, eliminated from this discussion. And that means we have eliminated the smallest information 
which uh, was uh, otherwise called problem. Let me show you what we get from this. Uh, this is the, the cross conversion condition we would get if we applied this physic directly to this delta sigma, the pressure of the density. And this is what we get if we apply now this epsilon with about three, uh, R0 of 3 megaparsecs. In other words, we eliminate all the conversion to not 3 megaparsecs. And so now these are simulations. Uh, this is uh, the red line is the Taylor expanded um, prediction for uh, cross conversion condition. And the blue one is the one that we, where we don't get expanded, where we all those terms. You can see they are very similar. Uh, again, the point here is that this logic condition is very close to one, and its deviations away from one are well known with regression theory. So that means that if we know this R cross conversion coefficient, and the claim here is that we know it, it's one anyways, but it's what it's not one, it's uh, we can model with relation theory. So if we know this, then if we measure the cross correlation between galaxies and dark matter using galaxy galaxy density, and we measure all the correlation of, of the galaxies using just the sign of you know, galaxy correlation function. So how is B2 now naturally? So how is B2 now theoretically? Uh, B2. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So um, we find, as you can tell, that actually, at least in this picture, there is no uh, B2 doesn't, doesn't appear to be mass dependent. Uh, well, this B2 will be one, right? Theoretically, you would actually expect it is not uh, uh, And that's still a question which is uh, somewhat uncertain whether this is just because we're looking at a limited, fairly limited mass range, that is a halo between 10 to 13 and 10 to 14 solar masses, or whether that's uh, really uh, the case in this picture. Okay. We don't see, you know, as you can see, we don't see any uh, mass effects. B2 on this ground up, which is B2 or B1. Actually, I should be more careful. It's B2 or B1, and that's actually is less 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 than B2. So. But B2 in principle, yeah, B2 process zero actually. It's yeah. not like that. Yeah. You don't see that actually. You don't see that. No. In the, in, well, in this in this cross you don't see that. Yeah. Because I think the zero crossing is uh, you know, happens for one of these mass bins, but, but we do prefer to draw that. Happens around this mass that I think it's supposed to. Uh, the zero crossing happens just below number 14. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. Our mass things were kind of draw, so we didn't actually focus exactly on that. Okay. Um, so, if we think that we know R, then we can invert this relation and get just the dark matter crossing directly from this. Right. So, uh, again, we take this small. Uh, and so this is the, the reconstruction, therefore, of the dark matter clustering from the measurement of the galaxy clustering and galaxy clustering. Uh, the, the gray is our reconstruction from the simulations. The blue line is the nonlinear dark, uh, dark matter cluster prediction, and the red is the linear one. As you can see, there are nonlinear. Uh, this, this is a nonlinear regime, so we have to include nonlinear uh, corrections from the simulations or in terms of our spectrum uh, fits. Uh, but other than that, we are able to reconstruct very well the other power spectrum. This works on, uh, we tried this on a whole bunch of different simulations, a whole bunch of different theoretical models, works well. And so here's an example where we vary different cosmological parameters, and in each case, we reconstruct very well the other power spectrum. And these are basically the differential ratios. <laughs> if you, you know, this is now expressed in terms of the stress separation. If you want to, you know, Look at what the kernel is, uh, what the window is in, in Fourier space. Uh, at 20 megaparsecs, it peaks roughly k of 0.1, and then at 5 megaparsecs, it peaks more like k of 0.5. Like so this is fairly nonlinear. These are very nonlinear scales. Um, it's 5 megaparsecs. Okay, so that's one thing uh, that I wanted to mention. So um, we have started to apply this to the data. Let me just give you. Uh, uh, an example, uh, it's very preliminary, not yet uh, ready for publication, but uh, for example, this is an example of the two-point correlation function for three different tonality samples. Uh, these are these would be, uh, L4 is what we call L-star galaxies. Uh, L3 would be one to below L-star, so they have slightly less, lower bias than L-star galaxies. And then L5 would be one minute above L-star, and they actually have significantly higher bias. Uh, so this is the other correlation. This is the uh, cross-correlation analysis from the lensing. 
okay? Uh, and then if you uh, combine to get a dark matter, you know, take particular formation, then you get this three lines. And the point here is they all uh, overlap with each other. In other words, we have uh, gotten rid of the bias, the overall bias, um, and the claim is also the skin bands of the bias. And then the claim here is that we have to get through that and across the blue line here. The blue line is four, six, nine, four, eight. So where's RV or roughly? What? So RV or is roughly like two or three? These are fairly small galaxies. These are main sample galaxies. These are the S star galaxies, right? So you know, RV or would be the one in the bar six. So yeah, here is why there are. So you, yeah, you can probably draw this thing down to a main function. A similar uh, application to luminous red galaxies. Again, here is a two point clustering. Now this time we do this upsilon thing. Uh, and this is the cross correlation. Lensing and superimposing that is the theoretical model prediction. Now we see that one and we can see it as well in the data. So again, this is also preliminary, but you can see basically we can basically measure the dark matter phosphor. Okay, um, now how can one do better? Um, and so far, what we used was the uh, clustering information and the lensing information. Notice we did not use the shear shear uh, correlations at all. Uh, those of you who follow weak lensing, they, you know, you probably know that shear shear correlations is what pretty much everybody is focusing on. Right? Because shear shear is directly sensitive to the dark matter. The claim of uh, our claim here is that you don't actually need to uh, use shear shear correlations, you can just use the galaxy galaxy lensing combined with the galaxy clustering. Uh, assuming that uh, you buy this argument that we can model this cross coefficient. And that actually buys you a lot in terms of systematics, because systematics in the shear shear analysis are very, very difficult. There's a lot of uh, camera distortions, PSF uh, distortions, all sorts of junk that induces uh, a superior signal in all operations, but act pretty much goes away when you do the cross correlation around uh, point like objects like that. Okay, so how can we do better? Well, um, the third thing that um, people usually talk about is uh, cluster abundance. Now, it's actually very easy to add uh, the, cluster, the abundance information to this analysis, which is that we can do exactly the same analysis as a function of abundance of these objects. Now, abundance, uh, in the case of gases, doesn't actually uh, do very much. But if you apply uh, this analysis to the clusters, then actually in that case, uh, abundance uh, actually provides a lot of information. Uh, and let me just uh, basically show you what we do. So we here we take um, uh, clusters of the, you know, here we take about 6,000 clusters. These are, uh, the plots I'm showing you are from Max DCG clusters, but there actually some new, uh, new cluster catalogs uh, out there that have just uh, come out that uh, we have right now. And so again, we do exactly the same two uh, analysis as before. One is the all correlation analysis, project, uh, projected uh, all operation W, projected uh, correlation function. And the other one is the lensing analysis. And you can see basically how small the errors are on this lensing analysis. Right? In fact, in this case, what is interesting is that the all correlation analysis uh, has larger errors as because of the sharp points. We only have 6,000 off. Um, in the case of clusters, you have to worry about one more thing, which is, especially if you, do, if you try to bring in abundance analysis, uh, abundance of clusters, basically you want to know what the mass of the clusters is, and that you get pretty much from the length of analysis. But you also want to know what the, what the scatter is between whatever you're observing, for example, the richness of the clusters, and the, the, the halo mass. And we want to parameterize this in terms of the scatter, which can be pretty much a free function. And as you can see, this leads to actually a reduction of the other correlation and of the cross correlation. <coughs> so I think I have another point. Yes, for example, so we do this analysis of this projected uh, correlation function, and um, basically, you know, from this we can just read off, for example, what the scatter scatter is. And as you can see, actually, in this case, it's actually small, but that's because uh, I think I specifically put on a model. If I take an, a model with a slightly lower mega matter, this could Right, and so uh, here is analysis of uh, lensing, and you can see basically that a model is made of 0.8, uh, and again a scatter of something like 
four, so uh, pizza data are reasonably well. So why is the bias not in there with this? Uh, the problem, which bias? No. Of your, of your sample, uh, uh, the cluster bias. Yes. Um, that's actually a huge thing, uh, which is the, the way um, bias, um, as you increase in weight, bias again goes down. Right? Uh, and it happens uh, for this abundance of 2000 minus 5, b squared times sigma a squared, or b times sigma a is constant. And so this actually, uh, this, this ambiguous population actually, actually is independent of the bias and of sigma x. So that's actually a good thing because it means that uh, this two point population function actually directly gives you a scatter. So uh, the bottom line here is that you can get actually pretty small errors. And now, as small as yes, of course, you can trust the results because uh, here you have to model the clusters. Uh, the plasma matter distribution inside uh, inside the clusters, you have the model uh, the baryonic things and stuff like that. And you can see there's an excess signal on small scales well, if you just look at that one. But that's something so, so, so can you we'll be a little more precise about the definition of signal? Sigma A? No, no, no. Oh, sigma, yeah, right. That's just the log, log normal scatter uh, in between the observable, which is uh, the N200. The N200. So it's N200 and M200. Yeah, that's, and yeah. you're assuming it's a lot more normal yeah. of the ratio of the gaps. And to what extent have simulations uh, given a handle on what the signal will be? Simulations, no, I wouldn't trust simulations. Well, uh, that's another question. But yes. Uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust simulations. Well. Pre presumably, in principle, you could use the um, uh, the big uh, uh, survey of, uh, of the group thing. The best, the best way people have tried was to uh, to X-rays. Uh, in other words, the, uh, you estimate the scatter uh, against the X-rays, sure. and then you say, well, scattering in X-rays is much smaller than scattering in optical, and uh, that's how. Okay, that's that, that's absurd. But I'm just thinking of uh, you know the semi-analytic methods. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't think it looks very much. Um, um, but in any case, the scatter from the from that X-ray studies, uh, those X-ray studies, the scatter is supposed to be between 0.4 and 0.6. But um, the uh, with the max PCG, there was supposedly uh, an interaction of lensing with the M200 and a relationship with the The mean, yeah, on the mean, sure, yeah. That, that's well, that's the other way this way. Well, are these your measurements? Yeah, these are our measurements. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you have done something beyond what these earlier papers did. For well, but this is this is fact and honest, right? If, if this is not going to give you the scatter. This will give you the mean of that relation. Okay, and that's as you can see, we can get that very very rapidly. Right? The error is very small. But then there's also a question of scatter, right? which is a bit more difficult to get. Uh, if you, therefore, if you, go, if you add the other equation analysis of the process, then you can get that. That, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Okay, but that, but keep in mind that's uh, combining small scale lensing information, which gives you the mass of the halos, with the large scale uh, information of clustering, which gives you a scatter. At the same time, we can also have, we can also do the, the method I was talking about before, which is the low large scales, cross correction coefficient is one, and we can just combine this with this and just get uh, again back to the clustering. So we have two independent ways of measuring information, and here I'm just presenting basically an optimal uh, approach to combining all this information. Information from clustering, from uh, lensing, and from abundance, which basically just holds all information in there. Again, unfortunately, we haven't finished it yet, so I know, I know you see my angle something like this, but uh, at least statistically the errors are actually very small, about 3%. Okay, so. Uh, and then another observational thing that I wanted to mention um, is uh, now that I've talk, talked about uh, this galaxy, galaxy lensing, which is telling a lot of dark matter around galaxies, um, we also can combine that with uh, clustering information uh, and the measurement of the redshift space distortion parameter beta. Um, why is this useful? This is useful. So imagine you have this, uh, this delta sigma cross correction between galaxies like matter. This is proportional to the bias parameter. 
Now, the order correlation is proportional to bias squared and sigma a squared. This one is proportional to bias and sigma a squared. You can see sigma a squared has canceled in this ratio. So this, this ratio is not proportional, it's not dependent on the amplitude of this ratio. Now we have v divided by v squared. We still have one term of bias. But now I also bring in the so called redshift space and social parameter beta, which is uh, basically um, the logarithmic growth rate uh, f divided by v, and that will cancel uh, bias completely. And the, the final answer is that this particular ratio depends only on the growth rate of structure and, and the manifest, and does not depend on the amplitude of fluctuations. Now that's useful because actually you can probe uh, various modifications of gravity. Uh, the reason that location of gravity usually affects the rate of growth structure, uh, but they might be degenerate in the amplitude. So, you know, there's no amplitude in this test. You know, because logic, we usually, when we talk about structure formation, we always have the amplitude fluctuation as the thing that we measure. Here, by combining two uh, independent measurements of the same data, we can cancel out the amplitude, and we are left with just uh, a dynamical measure of rate. So we tried this on the small digital sky survey, um, where again I'm showing you know, pretty much the same kind of analysis as before. So all the formation analysis of, of the hit of the galaxies, uh, superimposed on that is our best uh, simulation, uh, combined with the cross correlation, and then we also have the redshift space disclosure parameter, and then the final result of this point EG is uh, shown here. These are the data points. This, this is basically the box is the combined error. Um, or this range of scales. Uh, GR and lambda CDM works perfectly. It's right, right bang on. But for example, some of the modification of gravity, uh, echo bar, for example, gives slightly lower value because the rate of growth structure is slightly higher. And uh, this modification of gravity that uh, are the relativistic modifications of mold theory are particularly, uh, they are particularly badly on this test because at least those, uh, the models that have been having the, uh, so far uh, predict a lot of rate of growth um, uh, over this range. This is happening at redshift 3, the measurements are, uh, sorry, the, the measurements are redshift point 3. And so as a result, they predict this point which is way too low compared to the position. So. so why is the upper bar by the prediction not overlapping with the normal geo prediction? Uh, yeah. Well, the bar has a range of possible x, a range of your range of possible Gravity models, right? So, like, you know, in principle, it includes normal gravity, right? Uh, F of R, there is a limit, yes, where, uh, <laughs> sure, sure. It yeah. includes normal gravity, yeah. yeah. It, it, there is a limit when, when you're used to land this yeah, right? But uh, in terms of this, uh, you know, F prime, um, in terms of this pre prime that people usually talk about, yeah, exactly. uh, there's exactly. a wide range, there's a wide range where this number is fairly constant uh, and it gives measurable deviations uh, from lambda CDM and then for very small values of that parameter, then minus five and below, then it slowly approaches lambda CDM. So yeah, I wouldn't say this is, this is uh, there's a one in the prediction of that bar. But uh, there's a wide range of parameters. So what's the F, I guess, corresponding to this little box here? Oh, sorry? What's the value you forgot corresponding to the loss of the Yeah, prime. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as I said, this is, I think, uh, everything, everything between 10 minus 5 and 10 minus 3 um, is this. Isn't the point that you've done to reduce acceleration? No, that's not clear. No, it's way more bigger than that. Yeah, but it does, but. Sure, sure. Why do we you care about you it? You reduce. <laughs> no, but the acceleration, I mean, you reduce lambda with, with, the, with the zero point, sir, right? I mean, but then you have the next parameter, you know, the F or whatever it's called. Uh, but then you have uh, the next parameter, which is the one that really is tuning the, if you want, the, the strength of right, the G effect. And that one uh, is, uh, I think. So it's probably constrained to be less than 10 minus 5 or something, right? You know, from the um, uh, from that, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So no, 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 sorry. No. For eyes out, you get 10 minus 1 or something like that. You need, uh, you need uh, cluster bundles, actually. From cluster bundles, you get. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay, but right. Okay, right. 
the current constraints for randomized model. The question was, you know, you know, so is there? Yeah, I think randomized model. Like, Thing, that one is still uh, giving deviation like this, but then below that, as you approach to minus six, and so it's slowly approaching. Uh, and you can see, as you can see, this is not compared to the cluster of other And currently, yeah, in the future. Yeah, the future will be probably, uh, right, because the cluster of other will improve too. So, yeah, I'm not sure this will be getting this way. Maybe. Yeah, so we'll see. Okay, um, all right, now I want to talk about something else, um, which is um, how we can further reduce uh, the errors. And uh, the idea is um, that we have now, again, two different tracers, right? Uh, for example, we have this projected um, mass to, to the landing, and we have this projected galaxy clustering. And if we take the ratio, we get something uh, which depends on the mega matter density and bias, and but where this uh, density revision can drops out. This is actually something we really pointed out. And um, the thought was that uh, this um, way of canceling sampling variance, what is sampling variance? What is cosmic variance? It's dependence on the stochastic nature of the density projection itself. Right? So if in this ratio, this delta is, has dropped out, and so the you know, principle, therefore, this ratio does not depend on the cosmic variance. The problem is that it depends on the there's still a lot of specificity, especially in the galaxy cluster. And so the, the thought was, well, okay, maybe this doesn't work so well. I can show you in a second. Here is the scatter between uh, mass density and halo density, which is normal uniform weighted uh, galaxies. You can see there's a lot of scatter. Right? All right, but let me now uh, move to something else that I wanted to mention. There's a way to suppress this um, uh, scatter and suppress the shot noise which is uh, by trying to basically weight uh, halos uh, as, uh, as if they are to, to come as close as possible to the dark matter. Now the idea is that, um, you know, it goes back to Precious Schechter, right? Precious Schechter said, well, all of the dark matter is inside the halos. Well, some of them may be very small, but all, all of it is inside the halos. So if you take this idea seriously, then uh, we should also keep in mind that when we model the halos, we say they're shot noise, 1 over n bar. Um, but when we combine uh, everything into dark matter, there is no shot noise. And that's because uh, dark matter has to have local mass and momentum conservation. So whatever nonlinearities are developed, they obey local uh, mass and momentum conservation. And as a result, nonlinearities cannot develop k to the zero uh, tail, uh, going to this uh, low k cannot be uh, white noise. It, in fact, it has to be before. So in other words, there is no sharp noise for the dark matter. The dark matter is uh, just a bunch of uh, halos superimposed uh, on top of each other. Uh, and so can it be that if we weigh the halos appropriately, can we cancel this, uh, this sharp noise? And so we try this by basically just giving the halos, uh, um, um, just weighing the halos by the halo mass. And uh, it's a well, but basically, this is what we get if we have uniform weighting, and this is what we get if we do that. Well, so basically, the shot, uh, the shot noise amplitude, this is just the variance squared, uh, and it goes down. Right. It goes down by a factor of several. All right, so that was interesting. So we tried to do a full analysis um, to, of this noise covariance matrix, which we find uh, the difference between the... Um, so we, we divide halos into, into halo mass bins, and uh, rather than look just at a one halo mass being where the diagonal term um, would be uh, basically just this shot noise, we look also at the correlations between the halo mass uh, It's always relative to the dark matter. So we find like that, and we find that this matrix has uh, basically three eigenvalues. Uh, most of the eigenvalues are just one over m bar, just one, what one would be by the sum model. Uh, there's one a very large eigenvalue, well, very large, you know, five or two large or something. Is this one, and we think this one is just related to the to this uh, uh, B two hidden biasing. Uh, and then what is important is there's one uh, eigenvalue which is very low, and that's the one that is giving us very very low noise. If we look then at the eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue, that's this one here, we basically find its uh, mass. Proportion to mass, a high mass end, and it's proportional to the quantum low mass end. 
Whereas this other one, this one uh, corresponds with this, minus eigenvalue is just a speed to wave. And actually, you can see this plus is zero right there. One can actually compute in, in the in the Taylor model this this uh, covariance matrix, uh, and there's one uh, correction one has to put in, which is the Taylor exclusion that I mentioned already before, uh, means that when you talk about Poisson uh, Poisson model, you don't have a full volume that you can place down your spheres because some of that volume has been taken out by exclusion of the halos, right? And because of that, you know, basically you have one over bar, but then you have to subtract out the term, which uh, you can model based on the volume, you can model based just by the mass of the halo drive by the density. Okay. And that's some other terms here. So anyways, this uh, gives a very good agreement with the, with the eigenvectors. It gives reasonably good agreement with the uh, of the eigenvectors. Just these simple answers for the, for the lots of race. Um, all right, so what I want to say here is basically uh, what I want to say here is therefore the, we think we understand this, what is happening here, and uh, this is the, so basically what we're saying is that uh, these are uniform we uh, weighted halos, and we're saying, uh, and this is the halo model prediction, and, uh, and then this is the corresponding mass weighted halos, and this is the corresponding halo model prediction. And you can see basically that we can reach we have reached uh, very small values of scatter already, and possibly we can reach even lower as we push towards smaller smaller amount of halos. Now, why is this useful? Basically, this is giving us very small specificity between dark matter and the halos. Um, just to give you an example, you know, I said this is what uniform weighting gives a lot of specificity between the uh, halos and dark matter, and this is then what this mass weighted um, halo field. The mass weight you mean the eigenvector weight? Yes, right. so it's not quite mass, it's mass n plus n zero. <coughs> yeah, this is the optimal case, right? This is the, 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 that eigenvector that is not the that we And so, you know, you can do a lot of things with this, but you can just uh, invert this quadratic, there's a quadratic relation here, because you're looking at that, and you look into that. Uh, but the point here really is that, uh, you know, if the point here is just going back to what what I started from, if you now just have just one mode, for example, right, and you know there's no specificity between matter uh, and halos, you can just read off this this uh, bias or bias over all the end that I mentioned before. Right? Because there's so little specificity. Whereas before, you know, for one mode, the specificity was large, and you did not do that. So is the smallest mass then dominating like the information? No, high is not such. Because remember, you're waiting by mass, right? Yeah, you know, but so that's just, I mean, the, the shot noise is, is smallest for the lowest mass weight. Right. But you know, but these are the same halos, uh, uniformly weighted, right? We have the same number of density of halos here and here. It's just that these are weighted by mass, these are just uniformly weighted, right? So it's this, as I said, it, it all counts from basically this. Uh, volume, uh, exclusion volume, which you have to put into your Poisson model. Okay. okay. Um, all right, so finally, uh, in the remaining uh, time, I want to mention a few things about coronal anxiety. You've probably heard a lot of, about this already. Uh, I'll just talk about this you know, local model, FNL, pi square, and uh, this uh, paper by uh, Neil and company uh, here that pointed out that there is a scale dependent bias uh, that shows up for biased uh, clusters, uh, for biased uh, halos. For example, here's one well, from our simulations we show, where we show that you have FNM equal zero, you get clustering just like this, but if you have FNM equal 100, then clustering is enhanced as you go to lower k, and you have FNM equal minus 100, uh, suppressed as we go to lower k. So on large scales, we pick up a scale then bias. All right, um, we have actually tried uh, and applied this to the, to the real data, uh, the prediction, um, and uh, we find that the best tracer is our our uh, magic tracers from Sloan, uh, especially those at uh, uh, 
to 1.5 and 2. And that's because they have high bias in 7.5. And uh, you know, we have actually no detection with a very small error. Now, this one bin is a broad bin, but this was all to you know, came out of 1.2 or 2. So it's very large scale. All right, and so for that, we find this non-detection, but uh, limits which are uh, quite uh, favorable compared to the CMB is roughly the limits of the same order. Okay, but I want to talk about uh, this uh, uh, shot noise and sampling variance noise canceling between the pipe to, to this method, which is, uh, now imagine that we have, um, again, when you look at the power spectrum, you're looking at the power spectrum on large scales, and there will be a lot of uh, sampling variance when you measure the power spectrum, just because these modes are stochastic, realizations of the Gaussian random field. Um, so, uh, but if you model now this effect as uh, E1, so the, imagine you split these halos into two types of halos with two different bias parameters. Imagine that, um, you know, just for simplicity, one of these bias parameters is to just one. And there is no disconnect effect for one of them, but there is an effect on the other one. This alpha is homogeneous as well. You take the ratio, and you can see that this delta has canceled. Right. And so in the ratio between the of, of, uh, clustering of the two halos, you suddenly no longer have uh, cosmic variance problem. But we have tried this in the simulations, uh, and we find extremely small errors uh, on this technique. Uh, but however, I, sh I should emphasize we find this when we compare this against the dark man. Uh, okay, so if you take this second sample of being dark matter, then we find very small errors. If it's not dark matter, then we have to do more complicated analysis. We're doing this right now. We, find, we think we find very similar errors also in full analysis. Without dark matter, we have to issue that. But uh, here, clearly, we see the, uh, the effect of uh, this cosmic variance. Uh, cancellation, because you see how small these errors are, and you know, this can be compared to compare to these kind of errors here, these are the same issues. Very small errors. Okay, um, and finally, uh, the discussion so far has been uh, mostly on the power spectrum, but of course there's more information in the, in the clustering. Uh, you know, we can do a full bias spectrum analysis, so we are trying to do this uh, here. Again, we start with that ansatz of the big background split ansatz. First of all, we start with that local biasing ansatz, and we we'll expand. But now we expand the halo plus halo density, uh, both in terms of the um, matter density. We have the D1 zero, D2 zero delta squared. But then we also expand in terms of this uh, gravitational potential phi. We have some other you know, uh, parameters: D zero one, D one one. And Two, which are expansion in terms of the gravitational potential of phi. All of these parameters can actually be uh, determined in terms of this peak background split. Uh, and indeed, this P01 is just the, the you know, gives exactly the, the expression that uh, you know, the volatile found. But now, of course, one gets all of these other provisions uh, as well. So, in order to do the y spectrum, we do the we basically do the three-level uh, calculation. Uh, there's a lot of bookkeeping terms, but you know, basically there's just three-level calculations you have, but there are a lot of them. Why there are a lot of them? Because there's a lot of ways how you can create normal sanity. You create it through um, this B, uh, B2 term, delta square, that was through uh, uh, nonlinear biasing. You get it through nonlinear gravity, and you get it through this FNL. And so there's a lot of variables that we uh, have found. Uh, but the end result is actually quite uh, good in the sense uh, that we get predictions which are in very good agreement with simulations. These are some simulation <coughs> results from uh, Nishimichi et al. And uh, this is a function of opening angle between the two k vectors. This is a function of uh, k vector itself or fixed opening angle. Uh, you know, in both cases, we get reasonably good prediction, at least after k for one or so. So, uh, one can then... This is this for halos or this for the matter? Is that no, it's for halos, yeah. yeah. Um, if you change like the mass bin and the other one, you also find something uh, Well, we took whatever they, they have in their, in their estimation, which is uh, 
bias of three near four. Okay, so it's a very hard time bias. Here as well. So, uh, you know, since this agrees uh, reasonably well with simulations, we can therefore now make an estimate of signal to noise. Um, from the bias spectrum, this is our result. Now well, this, uh, you know, expressed a bit funny. Uh, I can explain why. But, uh, this signal to noise for f level of 100. All right. So and you can see, you know, we get a signal to noise of 20 or so. So that means that one signal <coughs> error on uh, f will be five. This is for a specific volume. We took 10 millibars of volume. So the point is that if you just have a single tracer, power spectrum method, uh, then you get a factor of several, you know, six times lower significance <coughs> for this kind of tracers. And of course, if you take lower bias uh, tracers, then signal to noise drops for the bias spectrum, but at least you get something, whereas for the power spectrum you get nothing, because once bias is one, then you get signal to noise drops and it goes away. So uh, the bottom line is that uh, by spectrum should give us much more information than the power spectrum uh, in the Nagel FNL. And so the hope is that when we combine now these multi tracer techniques um, and apply them to the body spectrum, that we'll get even smaller errors, and that, that ultimately this will be uh, a much, you know, this, that ultimately will, the smallest errors on FNL will come from, from this galaxy uh, uh, surface. Uh, right now, uh, it appears that. So the plant would expect to have the air of four to five to seven, all right, and the future the surveys, uh, such as cross or something like that, will also be errors of the same order. And maybe there will actually be errors which are much smaller than that. Okay, uh, all right, so I guess I have this as well, uh, which is the same technique now, the short noise canceling, uh, sorry, sensor variance canceling <coughs> technique, but now this time applied to the Rashi space distortions. Uh, Rashi space distortions is an effect where you, due to the velocity, you, have, you get an enhancement of structure. It's easiest to see this in the Fourier space where enhancement is uh, along the rate direction um, of the Fourier mode and in proportion to the rating growth rate and the angle, cosine of the angle, in the square. So nu is cosine of the angle to the minus side in the Fourier mode. And basically, Rashi space distortions just squeeze the, the structures, right? And basically, they enhance the plasma in the radio direction. All right, so um, the reason why this is interesting is because, um, uh, again, the way we traditionally determine this stretch state distortion part of the data is by looking at the clustering in the radial direction relative to the transit direction. But since we are now looking at different modes in radial and transit direction, this will depend on different of this delta, and again, sampling variants will, will play a role here. Because our space distortions can only be measured on very large scales, this is a serious problem. Now, if, on the other hand, you take two tracers, <coughs> and you take this ratio, you'll cancel delta, and you'll get something which depends only on the relative bias and on this beta parameter, our space distortion. So again, we cancel out the cost of variance. In fact, we can do even more, because at, at oblique angles, uh, so, you know, for example, you can just take this uh, ratio in transverse direction, where mu is zero, and the radial direction, where mu is one, and you can just measure that this becomes the data uh, and the ratio of biases. But if you take it at the bleak angle, then actually you get something which depends on the product of the Hubble branch and the angle of the which is this opportunity test. Um, so, which you can also measure without sampling variance. All right. Um, Okay, so um, in the future, what we still need to do is we need to understand better these non effects. I think. But, uh, we, in order to develop full model galaxy clustering, we still need to understand better non relation between galaxies and dark matter, um, we understand better retrospective distortions, uh, what I've discussed here, or linear, you know, Kaiser theory, Kaiser level theory, but there are a lot of non linear effects, we need to think of not and stuff like that, that haven't been modeled yet. Um, actually, here yeah, I'm showing uh, an example where we try to apply Kaiser theory to the various like data from observations. We get a reasonably good agreement compared to the input theory. The simulations up to the tail of 0.1, and then it goes to 
due to the finger of the of the finger. So this is a way to set up better. Um, and then, as I said, we also use point analysis of two point three point relation for All right, so this is my summary. Uh, basically, um, just you know, to tell you what the program is here. So, you know, galaxy clustering we think has long, for a long time been recognized as a useful trace of large scale structure, but it has always been plagued by these issues of bias, uh, which first, uh, in the first models was scale independent, but now we are scale independent and stuff like that. So the first thing one can do is by, you know, combined with the galaxy galaxy testing, you get some information about scale independence. <laughs> Uh, but then, if you add, uh, so if you add cluster, if you add abundance of the halos, then you gain even more. If you add pl cluster information from 3D and use this uh, sampling variance cancellation and shuffle cancellation, then you gain even more. Uh, and then finally, if you add bias vector information, then you get gain even more. So basically, all of these steps uh, will keep us busy for a long time, I think, because uh, we actually don't have to understanding still. In particular, we don't know how far, or how small scales can we push, uh, and we, that we can still reliably extract information from galaxy clustering. And at what point then does it come to hold this case? Because non-areas have to be swamped out of all information. Okay. This is not a problem because you, you, if you know you have two fundamental redshifts to split the galaxies such they are far away from each other uh, and, you, and they are both being lensed by some you know, matter in front of them and you still recover most of the information but you, you, uh, you don't have a problem with this alignment. The problem with this argument is that it's not quite true and the reason why it's not quite true is because this galaxy uh, which is far away from this galaxy could um, be sheared by the same tidal field that also intrinsic aligns this galaxy. And so we still get a, a correlation between this, in fact it will be under correlation between the galaxy and this galaxy due to this uh, cross term between the through signal that you have to shear and the tidal field uh, signal causing intrinsic alignment. So that, this problem actually is very difficult to get rid of in terms of shear shear analysis. Uh, if, if you do galaxy galaxy lensing, you don't have this problem. So in that sense, galaxy galaxy lensing actually is a better way to get rid of the physical alignment. Then. But we need to be able to separate galaxies uh, in quality. And if you can, then it's actually less of a problem. So um, if we just backtrack to near the beginning, you said the max PCG was being superseded by other centers. Yeah. I just said you were worried about exactly what it's all in the SDSS. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, so what are the problems with Mac PCG? Uh, one particular problem with Mac PCG is centroidy, getting the centers of the, of the clusters. That uh, specific method actually had a lot of uh, failures. In other words, uh, in the simulation of these, they found that about 15% of the clusters didn't find the correct central galaxy. And these new uh, algorithms are supposed to improve that, but again, uh, at least 
uh, based on simulations. Uh, the second uh, improvement of these new plus catalogs is that it's only going to high ratio. Uh, it's nice that you will limit to ratio point B, uh, but now we have plus catalogs which go up to ratio point five. So. Now, this may not be terribly useful for the lensing signal because most of these our source gases are also ratio point five, but you know, I think we can do it. We can get some information from those uh, clusters about ratio point five. And do you put that together? Uh, same group, Michigan group. Um, and then they're competing uh, across the catalog. There's one, actually, the gene gun, and the uh, NLP of power, and so on, put together. Um, there's another one coming out called Panda, which is a relay rifle. There are several of them. Well, I guess we can, uh, once we get into the cookies upstairs, so let's thank you all again. <laughs>